Good evening. Uh, good evening to those of you who are watching online as well. Uh, tonight we're going to continue in our study of the book of Acts. We'll be in the 8th chapter. The 8th chapter of Acts tonight. And uh, I'm tired of talking about the world we live in, so if you don't mind, I'm just not, just not. So, in the first chapter of Acts, Jesus foretold the coming of the Holy Spirit, and uh, how the disciples would be witnesses beginning in Jerusalem, then in Judea and Samaria, and then beyond to the ends of the earth. And the last time we were in Acts, we looked at Stephen's trial and his martyrdom. And that really marks the beginning of the great persecution of the church uh, that would last for centuries, really. Uh, There's also really the, the event that God uses to, to spread the gospel, to fulfill Jesus' prophecy there. And you remember that Stephen was one of the seven who was chosen to serve in the ministry of the distribution of the food. He uh, becomes the first martyr. And Philip was also one of the seven. And so here in chapter 8, this is going to uh, look at the beginning of Philip's ministry beyond Jerusalem as he goes and uh, ministers primarily in Samaria. So the, the text tonight, uh, is, you, you, if you've studied the book of Acts, obviously you've studied the events that, uh, that the, the eighth chapter describes. What I'm struggling with is uh, how to describe the fact that there's this supernatural element to the text that as Americans and as modern people, we are so sophisticated, we really have a hard time even talking about. So uh, I'm going to try to approach some of that tonight. There's, there's the supernatural reality to the kingdom of God from beginning to end. And everything about our experience as Christians is not rational. It's supernatural. And it's, it's not natural. It's beyond the realm of the natural world. Uh, that doesn't mean we can be illogical or irrational or whatever. But I'm just saying the whole nature of faith and the reality of God himself, all of it is a very supernatural thing. And God... And, and everything that is supernatural tends to be very mysterious. We can't explain it. We can't always quantify it. People have a hard time even putting in words the, the things that they experience, especially their relationship to God. There are two, two threads at work in the text that uh, we'll come back to at the end and, 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 and address them when we make an application, but I'll give you an idea of where we're going. So both, both issues that work in the text have to do with how we understand and act on what are essentially supernatural realities. So first of all, we're going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and contrast that with magic. Now, I don't know if you believe in magic or sorcery or anything like that, but uh, the, the text is going to deal with some of that tonight. And so there's a subtle difference between how one approaches either God or magic and why. Two very, two very similar things, especially the way that they're described in the ancient world. But there's a subtle difference between them having to do with how we approach and why, either magic or God. And so we'll look at that. The second major thread in the text that we'll talk about tonight that, that has this supernatural element to it is, is God's activity regarding uh, accomplishing His purposes in ways that we do not understand. 
that we would not have predicted. Is God free to do what he thinks is best? Well, uh, you know, the answer is yes, obviously, but if we were honest, we don't always like it. We don't understand it. We can't explain it. We can't predict it. And, and there's this, and hopefully you'll understand what I'm saying when we're done. There's this strange tension between the reality of, of living in relationship to God and, or, and the way that people live in reality to what they believe is magic. And so we need to understand the difference, the way that the Bible handles it, and make some decisions about how we're going to live our lives. All right, so I've hemmed and hawed enough. Let's, let's work through the text and then begin to put some of this together. Um, in the first three verses of chapter 8, we're going to see that God uses the martyrdom of Stephen to fulfill Jesus' prophecy that the disciples would be witnesses beyond Jerusalem. And so we're going to see how God uses this event in the, in, the, in the early church to scatter believers and to spread the gospel. So let's look, Acts chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. Excuse me. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. All right. Uh, Here in verse 1, we see that there was a serious, organized persecution of Christians in Jerusalem. It scatters them across the region while the apostles remain in Jerusalem. And so following the martyrdom of of Stephen. Uh, What had been gaining momentum really hammers down on the church and they just scatter. You can remember starting in in chapter 4 of Acts, um, there were several stages of how the Jews began to persecute the believers. Beginning first, Uh, In a trial with Peter and John, they were warned. Later, in chapter 5, they were flogged. Then with Stephen, who was a Greek or a Hellenist, uh, came the third Sanhedrin trial, and it resulted in his execution. The new factor in Stephen's trial that hadn't been present in the previous trials was the fact that the people supported persecuting or executing Stephen. Before, the people were all enthusiastic and seemed to be on the apostles' side. When it got to Stephen, uh, they were definitely opposed to uh, his ministry and his message, and they wanted him persecuted. It may have had some prejudice related to it because he was Greek. And in the text, Luke tells us that the, 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 the church was scattered, all except for the apostles. And that probably indicates that the real opposition in Jerusalem from the Jews was toward the Greek Christians and not to the Jewish Christians. And so Peter and John and all the apostles, those who were primarily Jewish, were able to stay in Jerusalem without any real harassment is what the text seems to indicate. While the Greeks, Philip, and those, the seven and those were part of their culture, they were being persecuted, and so they're scattered. And the word that Luke uses for their dispersal is the Greek word for seeds. And so it has the idea that God scattered them like seeds throughout Judea and Samaria. And you and I know that wherever they went, uh, they took root, and the message grew and multiplied. All right, in verse 2, it is Luke's, kind of wrapping up the story of Stephen. He is the church's first martyr, and it says that he is buried and mourned by godly men. It has almost the same kind of feel that Luke gives us after the death of Jesus when Joseph of Arimathea goes and, uh, and uh, intercedes with Pilate to get Jesus' body and buries him. Uh, this would have been you know, a very risky thing. Stephen uh, died a, uh, a criminal's death, and so was not entitled to a public burial uh, 
a formal mourning or anything like that. It would have been a disgrace. But these men sought him out in a very public way and honored him. In verse 3, uh, Luke further explains the, the life in, of Saul of Tarsus, saying that he does great harm to the church, terrorizing men and women of faith. So we can see how Saul's hostility increases. Uh, He is described as being a bystander to Stephen's uh, execution. It it later says that he gave assent to what was happening there with Stephen. Now it says that uh, he has become uh, almost hostile. It says that he ravaged the church. It's the word for destroy, and it's the same Greek word that's used for wild beasts tearing their prey apart. This is how Luke describes Paul's involvement in persecuting the early church. He ravaged them. He destroyed them. It says that he goes from house to house. That's probably a reference to him going to their house meetings, their individual assemblies, and arresting the men and the women that were there and hauling them away. And so, beginning with Acts chapter 4, I mean Acts chapter 8 verse 4, the story of the church's witness in all Judea and Samaria unfolds. It'll last through the 11th chapter as Luke describes how God spreads his message beyond Jerusalem and includes a wide variety of people. All right, next in verses 4 through 8, we see that persecution could not stop the spread of the gospel as the Spirit moves in power to heal, to defeat supernatural evil, and to bring people to faith in Christ. The persecution could not stop God's activity. Look at chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. All right, here uh, Luke is describing Philip's ministry in the region of Samaria and some amazing things begin to happen. Right away in verse 4, we see that persecution did scatter believers, but it also spread the gospel message to people living on the margins of Jerusalem. So the Hellenist Jews were scattered, but they shared the gospel wherever they went. And one of them, Luke tells us about Philip, who was one of the seven who, who, was, who were elected and set aside to serve and caring for the Greek-speaking widows. Uh, During the persecution, he fled. He goes north of Jerusalem to Samaria and proclaimed to Christ in one of their cities. And to this point, the church's witness had been primarily to Jews, almost exclusively to Jews living in Jerusalem. And now all of that is about to change as the message comes to the Samaritans. Now think back to Sunday school. Why did the Jews hate the Samaritans so? What do you remember? They were a mixed breed, and what else? There was one other serious accusation leveled against them. One was racial. The other one was what? It was religious. They were heretics. And So whenever you think of Samaritans, you're supposed to think of two things. Mixed breeds, and they were heretics. Do what? At Gerizim. Yeah, on the mount there. So they were descended from the northern tribes of Israel. You remember that after uh, Solomon, the kingdom divided into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So the Samaritans were descendant of the northern kingdom of Israel. Israel was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. You're going to want to know that. That'll be on the test. 722 B.C. Um, those who were not taken away as captives by the Assyrians were left in the land. They were usually the dregs of society, the poor, the helpless, the sick, the lame, the, the, the ones the Assyrians wouldn't want living in their capital city. 
And what they did was they took foreigners from other lands where they had captured and they had brought them to live in Israel. And so the descendants of Israel intermixed with uh, the Canaanites who lived in the land and then with the people who were displaced by the Assyrians from other parts of the world, and they were a mixed breed, as Jim said. And then uh, the problem is they still considered themselves to be the people of God because they were shunned by the people living in the south, the, the Jews living in Judea. They had to develop their own way of uh, worshiping Yahweh. So uh, they developed their own Torah, which was blasphemous. They uh, built their own temple on Mount Gerizim to rival the one in Jerusalem. And uh, they went on their merry way. Uh, a Hasmonean king, he was a Jew uh, named John Hyrcanus who died in 104 B.C., he conquered the Samaritans and brought them under Jewish control, and he destroyed their temple on Mount Gerizim. And it wasn't until the Romans invaded uh, Palestine that the Samaritans were liberated from Jewish domination. And after they were liberated and lived under Rome, they continued to worship God in their own independent manner. They were looking for the Tacheb, which was their version of the Messiah. And this, the Tacheb, would restore true worship on Gerizim, and he would prove to all of the Jews that the Samaritans were right. And so they were really you know, looking for him to come. And to the Jews, the Samaritans were simply half-breeds and heretics. They were hated, despised, and not to be taken seriously and certainly uh, left out of God's plans, other than to be destroyed when the time came. All right, in verses 5 through 8, Philip shows up and begins proclaiming, he begins preaching and teaching uh, about Jesus. And in his ministry, the Spirit displayed God's supernatural power, changing many lives. The result was joy and interest in the gospel among the Samaritans. So Philip, Luke says, preached to them the Christ. And you get the feeling that he's correcting their, their false ideas about the Messiah who was to come. And so his preaching was accompanied by signs, miracles, and all these supernatural wonders that pointed beyond themselves to confirm that the things that Philip was preaching and teaching them were true. They undergirded his message. And the way Luke describes it, we are to understand that the miracles were not the point. The message was. And the miracles just confirmed what uh, Philip was saying to them. Luke also tells us that the demons fled and cried out. Uh, paralytics were healed and uh, lives were restored physically as well as spiritually, and the people responded to the gospel message, and there's a sense of joy in the village. Uh, some wonderful things were happening. Uh, until, in verse 9, we, in verses 9 through 13, we see that uh, Philip's ministry led to many having faith in Christ, but it also drew the attention of a local magician named Simon. So let's look at verse 9. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. All right. Simon is a sorcerer. Now, do you believe in magic? Do you like illusionists? 
Yeah, you like a good card trick. Yeah. What about, uh, do you believe in superstition? Have you had superstitions? Have you ever paused before walking under a ladder? Or did you ever feel a sense of dread if you broke a mirror? You know, Or have you ever followed a horoscope? The, the astrology section. Um, or do you play the lottery? Sometimes I think that's magical. <laughs> people think, this is what's going to do it for me. Or um, uh, I've known people who've sought fortune tellers. Uh, the Bible describes this in the ancient world and, and affirms this as being a reality. People believed in this. So in verses 9 and 10, we see that Simon is described as a sorcerer or a magician who astounded the citizens with his magic. And when the Bible talks about magic, it's describing the ability to manipulate supernatural forces or supernatural beings with the use of secret knowledge. That's the idea. You know some sort of secret that gives you the end, the end on some supernatural being or some supernatural power to use to suit your own ends. Here, the, the base word for magic or for magician or sorcerer is the same, comes from the same word family of the word magi, which in uh, you know, Matthew's gospel describes those guys from the east who would uh, read into the stars meaning. They would chart the movement of the stars and have me, assign meaning to what they saw there. And in uh, Matthew's gospel, they understood the, the birth of the, the Jewish king had come, the Messiah, and so they followed the stars. The point is that these guys knew things that other people didn't know. Here, this, 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 the language for magic and for sorcerer, sorcery means that I'm using knowledge to manipulate supernatural forces to accomplish what I want. And it usually takes three forms. I, I use magic to hurt other people. That's black magic, right? So I can use magic to protect myself or people I love. Now, that's white magic. It has a protective sort of good kind of quality to it. The third use is so that I can know the future. And the idea is that if I can know the future, then I'll know which numbers to pick on the lotto and I'll be set for life. It's that kind of idea. So I'm either trying to hurt my enemies, or I'm trying to protect myself or people from those who might harm them, or I'm trying to manipulate the future to my benefit in some way. And so Simon may have been someone who had knowledge that allowed, them, that allowed him to do some things that appeared supernatural. And Luke doesn't tell us what, and it drives me crazy. I wish he would have said what it was. That, that Simon was doing just to satisfy my own curiosity, but he doesn't, and so we have to speculate. Did he perform card tricks? Did he do that whole, uh, the cup swapping around thing that people, I remember the first time I pulled a quarter out of my son's ear, I did that trick, he was real small, and he was so stunned, he fell down, you know. It, to him, it seemed really magical, and I don't know what, uh, what Simon was doing. Could it have been, you know, some genuine form of supernatural something? I don't know. Was it a card trick of some kind? I don't know. Did he know how to mix herbs in such a way that produced results that impressed people? Things that you and I would call chemistry or science, uh, but to the ancient world that just seemed magical. And we just, we just don't know. Uh, Luke gives us the idea that Simon may have been someone who knew ways to manipulate some sort of supernatural power or being. And I think uh, what Luke would expect us to understand is those would be demonic forces. Now already in this village here in Samaria, demons were present and were possessing the lives of people. It's not unheard of to think that Simon had a way of... Uh, being a part of whatever they were doing. Are you following me there? I, I just don't know. It's all speculation. What we do know is he, it, whatever happened made Simon appear powerful. And he appears to be somewhat pretentious. He boasted that he was someone great. 
And I'll just tell you that whenever a magician tells you that, you need to watch your wallet. <laughs> you know, just be careful. Be careful. Uh, whatever he was doing, he caused the people to proclaim him to be a divine power known as the great power. I don't know, as I said, what, what Simon was doing that won him this kind of attention or that caused Luke to call him a magician or sorcerer. The text indicates it was something supernatural. I don't know what it was, but uh, Simon was doing something. All right. In verse 12, Luke goes back to Philip's ministry, and it says that the crowds witnessed Philip's ministry and put their faith in Jesus Christ, and they were baptized. Uh, Throughout the text, Luke tells us that Philip preached the Word of God. He presented the Christ. He talked about the kingdom of God, and, and he proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ because salvation can be found in no other name. Uh, The Samaritans entrusted themselves to the gospel. They had faith in Christ, and they were baptized in mass. Men and women, large crowds of people, put their faith in Christ, and and Philip baptized them. In verse 13, it tells us that Simon was astonished by the supernatural displays in Philip's ministry. He is said to have believed in Jesus, but I think this kind of believing is not the same thing as saving faith in Christ. And I think we see this here in our country all the time. There's a lot of people who know about Jesus, believe in Jesus, have some sort of, some level of faith in Christ, but what they believe is not the same thing as saving faith. Uh, There's a difference, I think. And I think we see this with Simon. It tells us that he believed and was baptized, but Luke doesn't provide an object for his believing. He doesn't say that he believed in Christ or in the name of Jesus or in the kingdom of God or whatever. He does tell us that he followed Philip everywhere, totally entranced by the miraculous signs. So the question has always been, you know, was Simon a true Christian or not? The answer is, I don't know, but I don't think so. That's what I think. The truth is, we just don't know. All right, are you following me so far? All right, so here comes Peter and John. In verses 14 and 17, uh, Peter and John arrive and confirm and continue the ministry among the Samaritans, ensuring these new believers experience the fullness of God's spirit. Spirit. All right. If you are confused by the supernatural elements in the text, it's about to get worse. Look at verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. All right, what does that mean? Uh, This is a troublesome passage, I can tell you that much. So let's try to work through it. In verse 14, it tells us that Peter and John's participation in the Samaritan ministry was a sign that the whole Christian community, the church, recognized and received God's work among the Samaritans. So Luke is telling us the Samaritans who lived on the fringe, on the margins of Jewish society and Judaism as a way to approach the true worship of God, uh, the Samaritans were being included in the movement of Jesus Christ. This is a radical thing. There's no way to minimize how offensive it would have been for a Jewish audience. It's significant that the Jewish believers, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, send Peter and John, both Jewish, to go and confirm what's going on. And maybe the idea was that if it wasn't right, they would put a stop to it. But they didn't do that. They participate and further the ministry there among the Samaritans. It's an extraordinary cultural and racial moment in the book of Acts as uh, the gospel spreads beyond the Jewish community. In um, 
verses 15 and 17, the Holy Spirit's presence and work in the world and in people's lives is mysterious, unpredictable, and uncontrollable. And so I don't know that I'm going to explain to your satisfaction what happens in the text, but I hope that you come away with sometimes God's presence and work in the world is simply going to be mysterious, unpredictable, and uncontrollable. God does what he does. The Samaritans, it tells us in verse 16, had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Yet, Lucas told us they believed and they were baptized, large groups of them, in mass. So, this is not the usual pattern in the book of Acts. Usually, a person receives the Spirit and then is baptized. We see this different times. For instance, when Paul is converted... Uh, He receives the Holy Spirit, and he is baptized, and his eyes are healed. And so the healing, the Spirit, the baptism, they're all closely all tied together. But he is baptized after he receives the Spirit. This is also the case with Cornelius and those in his household in chapter 10. They receive the Spirit first, and then immediately they are baptized. It doesn't happen here with the Samaritan believers. It also doesn't happen... Uh, to the disciples of John the Baptist that we learn about in Acts chapter 19 in the, 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 the city of Ephesus. They were baptized first and then later received the Holy Spirit when Apostle, the Apostle Paul shows up and lays his hands on them and they received the Spirit then. So my point is that the book of Acts doesn't have one set pattern to describe how the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers. It's all over the place. Sometimes the Spirit is connected with the laying on of hands. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes the Spirit comes before baptism. Sometimes it follows baptism. What we do know is that the Holy Spirit, His presence and His activity is always closely tied to people coming to know the Lord. People do not come to know Christ apart from the Spirit's activity in their lives. Beyond that, We really can't say much, except that the Holy Spirit blows where it wills. Like Jesus told uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, it's like the wind. He just blows. You can see the effects, but you can't see the wind, and you can't control it. Uh, The Spirit does what the Spirit's going to do. And I think in cases like this, it's okay to say, you know what? It's a mystery. Don't use the word problem. It's not a problem. It's a mystery. It's not a riddle. It's just something that cannot be explained to make sense to my rational mind. It simply is what it is. Now here's why this is important. As Christians, uh, we make much of what's happened here in chapter 8. So first of all, do you think it's important that the Spirit came with the laying on of hands by Peter and John? Is that important? Is that evidence of what's called apostolic secession? Where the presence and the power and the authority within the church is passed down with the laying on of hands from one generation to the next, dating all the way back to right here, Peter and John in the New Testament. Is that what's happening here? Or is it not? Do you have any opinions about that? Is, this, is it significant? that they laid on hands. Yeah, Bill? Yes. For them. For them, that's right. So Roman Catholics, and uh, it's true in the Anglican Church, it's also true in many churches in the Church of Christ tradition, the Church of Christ tradition, that uh, this is something that is significant, and it is up, it's tied to the apostles. And it's important to be able to trace it back through the centuries to these first century apostles in order to know that what's taught in your church has the proper authority so that your baptism is uh, legit. Are you following me there? All right. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. So Jim's a good Baptist. And so what's important was that the Spirit was present and evident to Peter and John as well as the other disciples there. What's important is that the Spirit moved in a way that they could tell, that it affected people, it changed lives, and that's what's important. The laying on of hands, as Baptists, we'd say that's, that's not what is significant. And it's certainly not meant to confirm apostolic authority from one generation to the next. Uh, but other Christian denominations definitely, this is a very important issue for them, and it's one of the things that separates us as Baptists from some of the other denominations. Another issue in the text that comes up and tends to be important, does chapter 8 here describe what's called the second blessing uh, of the Holy Spirit? That, that is embraced in those who practice Pentecostalism. Uh, is this saying that as believers we need to have someone with authority who can help us to be filled again with the Spirit in order to experience the fullness of God's Spirit in our lives. What do you think about that? This is a Pentecostal idea, really developed in the early 20th century. Yeah, as Baptists, again, we say no to all of that. When you believed in Christ, you received the gift of the Spirit, all of the Spirit you would ever need. Uh, There isn't more being withheld from you until you do something or you reach some plateau or gain some secret knowledge or whatever. Uh, You have the Spirit. I hope that's good news for you. I mean, you have God's Spirit. Uh, There isn't more to come. And uh, because I just said that and it's going live over the Internet, I just offended every Pentecostal who is watching this, which is okay. It's not the first time. Um, Yeah. Depends on what you mean by that. Okay. I don't disagree. So Bill's asking, what do we mean when we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And it's a significant question. So I'll affirm that Pentecostals define that completely differently than what I do. So for me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit quickens me or comes into my life, enables me to believe and to place my faith in Christ, and I walk with the Spirit each day uh, until I meet the Lord face to face. I've been baptized. I've been rebirthed. I've been made new in Christ. My outward baptism is an... you know, in the baptistry is a symbol of that reality. It's just, a, I've been made new by the Spirit. I don't think the term refers to something that happens after I place my faith in Christ, where the Spirit falls on me in a very special and new way. I think that I can experience the Spirit moving in my life, but I, I wouldn't say that that's a second blessing. I guess I'm just looking at it differently than what someone would who comes from a Pentecostal background, would look at it. I don't know that I've answered your question well. Yes. Yeah. I, what I think this illustrates, because there's no way to, to work it all out, what I think it illustrates is that the work of the Spirit is mysterious. I am not able to explain even what's given to us in Scripture in a way that it all makes sense and the dots all connect. God's Spirit does what He's going to do. And I think what Luke is doing is just trying to capture this supernatural reality that was occurring in people's lives. And uh, we do the best we can over the centuries. And uh, 
here we are as Baptists, completely rejecting any kind of Pentecostal language. And so my, my, my hesitancy may not be theological or scriptural as much as it is just stubbornness. I'm a Baptist. It's in my heritage. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, well, it is, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. All right. Now, let's look at how Simon Peter confronts Simon. The magician. So in verses 18 through 25, we see that Peter confronts Simon concerning his need for repentance. Let's look in the text starting with verse 18. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because the thought you could because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of God, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. All right. So we have a very uncomfortable exchange between Peter and Simon the magician. In verses 18 and 19, we see that Simon believed that conveying the Holy Spirit was a power that could be acquired through special knowledge, and he offers to purchase this knowledge from the apostles. So, the, the way that the Spirit came upon these people, when Peter and John laid their hands on them, that caught Simon's attention, the way that Philip's miracles had caught his attention. He, he, uh, he saw something that, that struck him, and he offered money to Peter and John to get the trade secrets. How did you do that? What's the secret to that? And I want to learn to acquire that. It seems to be that he thinks he can acquire the ability or the knowledge to convey the Holy Spirit to others through the laying on of his hands. Uh, In verse 20, we see that Peter rebukes Simon in a way that could also be a prediction. Simon's greed... And self-centeredness were leading him down the path toward eternal destruction. Throughout the book of Acts, the self-focus that produces human greed is always depicted as a most destructive force. We saw it in the first chapter with Judas of Iscariot. Did his story end well? No. We see it in uh, the fifth chapter with the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Did their story end well? No, it's the first time someone died at a church business meeting. It's extraordinary. Um, So Simon was explicitly depicted as wanting the right to dispense the Spirit, but probably what he wanted was the knowledge or the skill to manipulate the Spirit to do his own bidding, to be able to work miracles and the like, perhaps to gain financially from that, which was what he did. He made a living through his uh, magical ability, whatever that was. One of the things that Peter tells us is that one can never manipulate the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always a gift from God, period. Uh, The Spirit is never subject to the will of people. We need to, to remember that. The Spirit is given to us by God's grace. Uh, The Spirit has never given given to us as a tool uh, to be used or manipulated for our own ends. In verses 21 through 23, we see that Peter calls Simon to repent, to turn from his self-focus, and throw himself on God's mercy. Uh, Peter tells him that Simon had no share in God's people or in God's ministry. Uh, He was not responding to the gospel. He was responding to his own 
self-interest, and his heart was not right before God, which is an alarming thing to say uh, because it has the idea that there's judgment coming. Your heart, you're not right, and therefore God is going to bring justice into your life, and it won't go well. But Peter offers him the chance to repent. It's not too late. You know, Simon, turn away from all of this and turn back to the Lord. So is that what Simon does? Do you think Simon repents? Verse 24 tells us that I think Simon does not produce the fruit of repentance, but continues to demonstrate his intense self-focus. He doesn't really apologize or say anything that indicates to me that his heart has changed. What does he say to Peter? Yeah, save me. <laughs> Do something. Do what you can do so that what you've said doesn't happen to me. Again, he's acting out of his own self-interest. He's trying to, uh, again, to, to manipulate the supernatural realities in order to save himself. He's not demonstrating contrition or repentance at all. And then Simon sort of disappears from the biblical record. Luke doesn't mention, mention him again. And uh, there are various uh, legends that go with uh, what happens to Simon. And I'm not going to waste your time going through any of those tonight because none of that is going to be on the test. I think the point is that Christianity has nothing to do with magic. And magic is powerless before the genuine power of the Holy Spirit. But Luke is clear that God's Spirit cannot be manipulated or bought. We have no influence, you know over this divine reality. It's him, the Spirit is a gift of God's grace who lives in our lives. We respond to the Spirit's presence. We don't manipulate it. In verse 25, Luke concludes this whole account by telling us that having completed what was to be done in that Samaritan city, the apostles returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming God's word in Samaria as they traveled. So here... Um, I think what, we're to, what we are to understand is the shocking nature of this, these Jewish believers proclaiming the gospel throughout the Samaritan countryside as they make their way back to Jerusalem. It's, it would have been an extraordinary thing. Uh, but God's message is reaching these who were living on the fringe of Jewish society and Jewish religion. All right. Two applications having to do with the supernatural. Here's the first one. I think I have to confront the tension within me between a destructive self-focus and my willing submission to God, His Word, and His kingdom. And there's a difference between how I approach magic and how I approach God and the realities of God. When I try to use magic, I'm trying to manipulate things I cannot explain or understand in order to accomplish my own ends, whatever they may be. And some of those ends may be good, some of those may be bad, I don't know. But I'm trying to control things for my own purposes. I relate to God differently. When I relate to God, I am submitting myself to Him, period, to do as He wills, as He wants for His purposes, for His ways. And uh, I am seeking Him. I am offering myself to Him. I am wanting not, not only to submit, but to hear and to obey and to be transformed. I want to be changed. Yeah, Bill? Yes, right. Yeah, and so Bill is asking about how does this practically affect prayer life, and I think it's, it's a relevant question. I want to make sure when I pray without ceasing and when I lay my requests before God and when I'm interceding uh, before God on behalf of other people for a variety of reasons, I want to make sure that I'm not expecting, I'm not, my, what's in my heart is not to try to get God to bend to my will. 
I'm trying to, Lord, this is what's on my heart. Uh, you've told me to come to you, and I am, and I trust you. I'm, I'm asking for your will to be done. Show me. Speak to me. Shape me. Help me to understand. Help me to be a part of what you're doing. Uh, increase my faith in you. Increase their faith. In you. you know, there's a lot of ways to look at it. But when, especially in praying, like for people to be healed, uh, I've prayed for people to be healed and they got up out of the sick bed and left the hospital. I've also prayed for people to be healed who went to be with the Lord. Uh, I can't explain it other than either way, people win. And even in, in, in the Gospels, when, uh, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus later died again. You know, there's only one ultimate healing, and that comes when we meet the Lord face to face. And that's what we're all longing for. And I want to make sure that when I pray, I'm not praying out of my fears, asking God to make me feel safe in this world. But I'm coming to Him in humble trust and submission, uh, really seeking Him, uh, His face, and not His hands necessarily. Uh, does that make sense? There's a very, it's a, there's a subtle difference. But in the ancient world, magical practitioners were all about manipulating realities for their own ends. I don't want to relate to God in that way. I want to submit myself to God. And so, does that make sense? You have questions about that? Okay. The other thing we see here that I think is important is that God's kingdom both now and in eternity, is composed of people from every tribe or nation, including those I despise or ignore. <laughs> we are all united together by the one Spirit of God. So Luke describes how the gospel came to the Samaritans, and the Jews would not have believed it, but it did. And Peter and John had to go see it for themselves, and they did. And the Spirit fell, and they proclaimed the message wherever they went. And I cannot explain who the Spirit speaks to and why, and who doesn't respond and why. And uh, God is completely free, and I simply need to have the eyes to see Him so that when I see, I can rejoice and participate in what He's doing, like Peter and John did. Who knows what they expected to find when they got to Samaria. What they saw were people putting their faith in Christ and... Uh, the Lord consistently uh, does things that surprises me. And I want to give him the freedom to do that, especially in today's world. Now, we may be completely dismayed and think that the Lord has let the wheels come off. It's just not true. Uh, I just need him to focus my vision so that I can see things perhaps from his perspective. And uh, that's no small thing. It's no small thing. All right. Next week, we'll uh, look into uh, the story of Philip and the eunuch. Uh, talk about evangelism and the Spirit's work as the gospel spreads. All right. Let me pray for us. We'll be done. Lord, as we come before you tonight, we acknowledge that... Uh, you are a great and mighty God. You are all-powerful and all-knowing. You reveal yourself to all peoples and all parts of the world throughout all times. And you are not limited by my understanding or by my geography or, uh, or anything like that. And so, Lord, we humbly come before you and ask for your will to be done in our lives and in our world. May your spirit use your word to shape us into the likeness of your son. And protect me from the temptation of trying to use you or to manipulate you for my own desires and ends. But Lord, I pray that my desires, my goals, my priorities, my longing in life would always be subject to your word and to your spirit. Lord, we pray for our time because these are difficult times. And we ask that somehow, Lord, if it would be according to your will that you would find a way, uh, that you would provide a way to unite our country together again. We ask that you would protect 
those in our government and those in law enforcement and all our first responders from any other harm or conflict. Lord, we pray as you see fit that you would protect the freedoms of people in this land, freedoms that we've enjoyed so that no one is forced to go against their will or against their conscience. And Lord, where it's appropriate, help us to know how to submit, how to relinquish our rights in order to serve your purposes in the world today as, is, uh, as it might be appropriate. Lord, we pray for those who are ill, those who are suffering from the coronavirus, and those who are suffering from other diseases, those who are enduring uh, medical procedures. We ask for healing, for restoration in their lives. Lord, we ask that you would lift up the downtrodden, and those who are feeling alone, those who are feeling depressed and anxious, that they might experience peace in your presence tonight. And in all of these things, Lord, we lay them before your throne, and we say that we trust you. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bless those who are here and those who are watching online so that they might walk with you the rest of this day and into the next. May your will be done, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.